Hey folks, today we are turning this machine into one of these using this little device. All right, so that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's not too far from the truth. Effectively, we're going to take my scanning electron microscope and turn it into a transmission electron microscope using this little widget. But first we need to take a quick overview about how scanning and transmission electron microscopes work for any of this to make sense. So this is a simplified diagram of a scanning electron microscope. You can see at the top, we have an electron source. This is what generates the electrons that are used to image our sample down at the bottom. The electrons come out in a pretty wide arc, and so we need a variety of electron optics here in the middle to focus and collimate those electrons to something useful. This beam of electrons will be focused to a point on the sample, and to generate an image, we need to raster that beam of electrons across the sample using what are known as scan coils. And these are just small electromagnetic or electrostatic deflection coils that bump the beam back and forth in an X and Y pattern to generate the image that we're interested in. And this is where a scanning electron microscope gets its name. It scans across the sample. When the electron beam strikes the sample, we need some way to detect that. And there's a whole host of different sensors you can use, but the most common are backscattered detectors and secondary electron detectors. And this is important for the project that we're highlighting today. So we're gonna spend a few minutes talking about how both of these work in an SEM. So you can imagine our sample has a bunch of atoms composed of a nucleus and electrons floating around in their electron orbitals. When we shoot a beam of electrons at our sample, there's a couple different things that can happen. The first is that just nothing happens. The beam of electrons passes by, it doesn't interact with any electrons or the nucleus, and we basically don't get signal from this location. Another scenario is where the beam of electrons gets relatively close to the nucleus. And because the electrons have a negative charge and the nucleus has a positive charge, there's an attractive force between these two parties. And the electrons are actually drawn towards the nucleus and do something of like a slingshot maneuver before being ejected back out of the sample. This is known as a backscattered electron. The electron hasn't gained or lost any energy, so it'll still be going the same speed that it was before. It's just changed direction due to this slingshot maneuver, similar to how you'd use like the moon or Venus or something to slingshot a satellite using gravity. So if we have a sample that is horizontal and our beam of electrons is coming down perpendicular to it, the backscattered electrons are mostly ejected in lines parallel or nearly parallel to that initial beam, which means if we want to detect these electrons, we have to put the detector right above it. So the, the typical arrangement is you'll have a hole for the electron beam to come out of, and then the detector itself, sometimes broken up into quadrants, kind of surrounding that hole so they can capture all of the electrons as they come flying back from the sample. Another scenario that can happen is that the electron beam will strike one of the electrons in orbit around this nucleus. The electron beam has a very high velocity because we accelerated it, meaning it has enough energy to kick this electron out of its orbit. And it goes off and gets ejected from the sample. And because the electrons in the beam are negatively charged and the electron itself is negatively charged, there's a force between these two, they're pushing on each other in an exchange of energy. And so the electron that, when it leaves its orbit, has been slowed down considerably compared to the initial high energy electrons we send in. And what this looks like kind of at a macroscopic level, again, if we have our sample and the electron beam hitting it perpendicularly, these secondary electrons are kind of just, you know, ejected in any which way. They also tend to be affected by the topology of the sample a lot. So if you've got a beam coming in and it hits, you know, an angled surface, a lot of those secondary electrons will be emitted kind of as you'd expect from the side of the sample. 
So we can use this slow electron property to our advantage and stick a positively charged detector on one side of the chamber. This detector is composed of a photomultiplier tube in the back with a scintillator in the middle and then a positively charged grid up front. And this is often known as an Everhart Thornley detector. And because these electrons are moving so slowly, if we put a big positive charge on this grid, it'll suck up all the electrons in the chamber that are just floating around with low energy. And a neat thing about these detectors, because these electrons have such low velocity, they can be emitted from the other side of the sample and still get picked up by the detector. And this is what gives secondary electron images a sort of three-dimensional quality to them. It's picking up electrons from all sides of the sample, even if it's not directly visible line of sight by the detector. So this secondary electron phenomenon is important, and we're going to abuse it later in our mechanism. But first, we have to understand what a transmission electron microscope is and how it compares to the SEM. So here is a diagram of a TEM, and in many ways, it looks very similar. We've got an electron source at the top, a whole bunch of stuff that look like electron optics, but there's this fluorescent screen down here at the bottom, and actually the sample goes here in the middle rather than at the bottom. So obviously this whole system works a lot differently. So TEMs work on the principle of transmission, transmitting the electrons through the sample rather than reflecting them off of the sample. We make this distinction because an electron has a certain interaction volume inside of a sample. So if we have a bulk sample here, when we hit it with an electron beam, that electron can kind of like bounce around inside the sample before it does something and is emitted as a backscattered electron, or it'll bounce around and then be emitted as a secondary electron. And this area where it bounces around is known as the interaction volume. And it tends to be shown as a kind of teardrop diagram, where statistically, this is where an electron will interact with something before causing an event. The interaction volume depends on the type of event that's happening. So a backscattered electron event might happen relatively deep in the sample, whereas a secondary electron event happens closer to the surface. But in all cases, this distance is relatively small, say 100 nanometers. What's important about this interaction volume is that it blurs the image. It reduces our resolution because the electron might enter and then start bouncing around before being emitted. And you can see that while the electron entered here, it exited over here. And so there's kind of an area of blurring where our nicely focused electron beam kind of blurs out due to this interaction volume. So the key insight to transmission electron microscopy is that if you make the sample really thin, well, there's just not a lot of material there to interact with. And so the electron beam will either pass straight through it or it'll interact with something in the sample but still come out essentially parallel to the initial beam entrance. And so now our interaction volume, we have a much smaller area. And so we get much better resolution on a TEM because there's just not as much material to deflect or interfere with our electron beam. So while scanning electron microscopes might make a lot of really interesting and pretty photos and they do great science, TEMs are kind of the unsung hero of electron microscopes because they have extremely high resolution and are critical to a whole variety of fields in biology and nanosciences. If we look back at this original diagram of a TEM, it starts to make a little more sense. We've got the sample in the middle, we're shooting electron beam down at the sample, and then electrons come out the other side. We refocus it with a variety of optics before it hits a fluorescent screen and there'll be some type of detector underneath it. And this is what generates our image. So that brings us to this little device that I made. This is known as a stem conversion device or a stem in SEM. And basically it turns your scanning electron microscope into a transmission electron microscope. And the mechanism to do this is pretty clever in my opinion. The device is structured with an angled metal plate at the bottom. 
and then a small sample cup at the top, which holds our very thin sample. And that's basically it. I mean, there's a few key caveats to how this system is arranged. For example, this metal surface here is polished and coated with something like platinum. And there's a very small aperture inside this device here underneath the sample. And there's kind of this like thing on top, which we'll talk about in a minute. But basically, it's a very simple device. We shoot a beam of electrons at our sample, and because this sample is very thin, most of the electrons will pass straight through it or might deviate slightly as they interact with the sample. They'll hit this metal plate. It generates a lot of secondary electron events, and these electrons will just be emitted and are kind of floating around the chamber, which can then be picked up by our secondary electron detector. And we've effectively created a transmission electron microscope inside the chamber because what we're seeing are electrons that have passed through the sample and then are picked up by the secondary detector. Whereas any of the electrons that might bounce off the sample, we're ignoring because we're not using the backscatter detector. And any secondary electrons that come off the sample and float around at the top are being collected by a special sleeve that absorbs them. So the only electrons that this detector is seeing are those that have passed directly through the sample and then are picked up by it, which is honestly pretty cool in my opinion. It's a really clever way to use the existing infrastructure inside of a SEM to get TEM style behavior. I stumbled on this kind of device a while ago, but when I went looking to purchase one, I found that they are very expensive for what they are. And you know, I have a machine shop, so I decided just to build one myself. You can see my model is effectively the same as the Pelco variety, just a little simplified. I coated a cover slip with 100 nanometers of silver and I'm using that as the angled secondary conversion plate at the bottom. There's a small cup to hold the sample grid, a small aperture to let electrons through, and then I 3D printed this sleeve to go on top and the sleeve is coated in just some graphite to make it conductive. And the idea here is it just needs to absorb any secondary electrons coming out of the top of the sample and then conduct them to ground. Now I wasn't really sure what to expect. I've never used a device like this before. So I ordered a test grid. This is a diffraction grating with 500 nanometer spacing and latex spheres placed kind of randomly on top of the grid. The spheres are 261 nanometers. If we look at this calibration standard under the backscatter detector, you can see that the grid itself is very bright because the electrons are bouncing off of the grid and heading straight back into the backscatter detector. But the spaces between the grid are completely dark, and this is good, because this means that the electrons that are passing through the grid are hitting that angled plate at the bottom of the device and being redirected elsewhere into the chamber so that the backscatter detector can no longer see it. If we turn on the secondary electron detector, kind of the opposite happens. The grid goes dark which is again good because that means we're not seeing any secondary electrons bouncing off the grid itself and making it to the detector. But the space in between the grid lights up because these are all the electrons that are passing through, hitting that conversion plate at the bottom and then being picked up by the sensor. Zooming in, we can see the diffraction pattern itself resolve. The actual resolution isn't great here. I was still figuring out what I was doing with this detector and all the settings on my machine, but we can very clearly see the diffraction pattern and the latex spheres. The numbers line up, it's a 500 nanometer pitch and the spheres are about 260-ish nanometers. So I think this is a great success, it means the device is tentatively working and we can start to look at some stuff. So I opted to look at nanoparticles. These are easy to prepare. You just drop the nanoparticles onto special TEM grids and let it dry. Uh, they're unfortunately not the best test subject because they're very small, so it's it's hard to resolve. But we should see something, I hope. So I have some nanoparticles sitting around from the laser ablation in liquid video. I also made up a solution of diamond. This is like diamond polishing grit, supposedly 500 nanometers or less. And then also some tungsten disulfide. Again, 500 nanometers or less is what the label says. And then I took some flake graphite and 
threw it in the ultrasound for 10 or 15 minutes. And this is kind of a classic way to exfoliate graphene monolayers. I don't expect that we'll be able to see the monolayers themselves, but we'll probably be able to see kind of different layered graphites after this prep. We'll start with the graphite because I think it was the most interesting and had the best images. This was also the one I did last, so I had the most practice at running these types of images. And we can see a lot of kind of aggregates of flaky layers or folds and ripples of the graphite. So it's impossible for me to know really how thick these different layers are. I suspect we wouldn't be able to see mono layers on my machine. It doesn't have probably enough resolution, good enough contrast to be able to see that. But what we're probably seeing are stacks of a couple dozen layers of graphene that are overlapping each other in different locations. And so the thicker the layer or the more layers that are stacked up, the darker that section will be because it's blocking or deflecting more electrons. Whereas the lighter sections are thinner because more electrons are allowed to pass freely. So you can very clearly see in a lot of different locations where different layers are kind of stacked and folded on top of each other. Which is really cool in my opinion. Like it's it's neat to be able to see that at a, a nano level. All these particles are a couple microns in size down to maybe 500 nanometers. Uh, but the thickness of graphene is only a couple nanometers. And so it's, you know, if we're guessing these are 20, 30 layers thick, they're probably 20, 30, 50 nanometers thick total, which is really cool. In a few cases, I found these long threads. I don't know what these are. I suspect it's a layer or several layers that have actually rolled up. So it made kind of like a quasi nanotube. I don't think it probably is a real nanotube that's actually bonded the way you'd expect a nanotube to be, but more of just like a fruit roll up of graphene, which is pretty cool. The tungsten disulfide samples were relatively similar. It's again, a layered two dimensional material. So it looks pretty similar in that we've got these different layers that are lighter or darker depending on how thick they are. A neat aspect of tungsten disulfide is that the crystals form octagons, and so you can actually see some nice little octagons in a few different locations. The gold nanoparticles and titanium dioxide nanoparticles were very difficult for me to resolve. Unfortunately, these are also the ones I did first, so I didn't really know what I was doing in terms of settings, but we can see that the titanium dioxide likes to form these little like filamentous aggregates each particle is probably on the order of 50 nanometers or so. Uh, they're kind of fuzzy blobs, so we're just guessing here, but they're pretty small. The gold nanoparticles that were more purplish in color, we're expecting to be larger, and that is mostly the case. We see that these particles are between 50 and 100 nanometers in size and tend to form kind of aggregates or clumps. Whereas the nanoparticles from the lighter kind of rose colored gold were very difficult to resolve and were probably on the order of 20 to 50 nanometers. They also were a lot more sparse because it was a more dilute solution, which didn't make my life much easier. Now this video is probably already getting very long, so I hesitate to go too much into detail here, but there's a lot of stuff that can be improved about my device. And I'm sure there's a whole bunch of other stuff that I'm leaving out here. It's very much a work in progress, not to mention sample prep itself. Okay, well, this was probably a much longer video than I was intending. <laughs> um, if you made it all this way, thanks for sticking around. I appreciate it. I hope this was interesting. It's kind of a niche and esoteric rabbit hole that I fell into, and I hope it was interesting to someone out there, even if you don't have an electron microscope yourself. Thanks to all my patrons who help support <laughs> these kind of projects. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure you're subscribed to catch the next one. And I think that's all I got for you. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.